thank you for joining us all and for everyone here as well. I think our panel particularly is a really good one to get started on given the theme for this year is Change for Good. I think all three of you are doing incredible work in that space and I'm really excited for everyone else to be able to hear about it because it's fantastic. Um, I mean, I'm going to start with a not so big question. I mean, if you know how to change the world, maybe you can answer it. But um, I suppose I'd like to know from all of you, because you're all doing such different things, what technology can do to, you know, to tackle, I mean, climate change obviously is the biggest one, but the environment in general, how do we, how do we look after our environment with tech in given with what all of you are doing? Vanessa, do you want to start? Well, hello, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for all being here. For tech in, in wildlife conservation, is a really cool thing, especially because I work on whales, humpback whales right now are in our big blue backyard, and we can use tech to spy on whales underwater. But we can also use tech to access them in ways that we've not been able to do before, or in ways that we used to be able to do, which would result in us killing whales, which I'm sure no one in this room wants to do. So tech is enabling us to not only access whales in, in ways that's not going to hurt them, like using drones to collect whale snot. That's something that we're leading at Macquarie University. That's basically a PCR sample for whales. They come up and they go... And then as they go, they do that, we have a drone with a petri dish. This is all collaborative research through Heli Guy Scientific. And it goes through, the whale goes, and the drone goes, and then it goes, snapshot. <laughs> because right now, this is going to sound really gross, we're all breathing in each other's viruses and it's delicious, right? So in the whale world, we just want to use that tech to capture their snot. So I'm really glad our PCR tests were not like that. <laughs> True. <laughs> we we can't ask a drone. <laughs> we cannot ask a whale to stay still. They just won't do that, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, I love it. That's a great place to start. Thank you. Vina, I know your work is not with whales, but how, how is your technology and, and the work that you're doing at the moment sort of f factoring into this space? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, it is, it is always an important big question when you actually sort of stop and reflect how the world needs so many different ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And I think there is a lot to be said when we talk about climate and waste and, and equity and, and STEM. One of the most important things, of course, we can do is listen to the needs of our communities. And so some of the challenges that we're facing now when we think about the amount of waste that is generated globally, um, whether it is you know, some of the waste that comes from our electronic sources, whether it's waste that comes from you know, our buildings, what we wear. But I think if we actually stop to reflect on what that means, if we're going to transform that into actually recycling, remanufacturing, and bringing all of those materials into circular economy that we sort of talk about, but it's then the question of how do you actually do it? Mm -hmm. And so the how we do it and how we deliver, it's very important that we also bring that tech, that science, the fundamentals to translate that into real world outcomes. So some of the things we're doing with our micro factories is exactly that, that you can actually take these resources, these raw materials, make products in our regional communities. And, and actually, the, one of the most recent micro factories that we've launched earlier this month in Nowra, um, and, and I've got a few sort of samples here to show, these are the kinds of things that you can make from waste mm. materials, waste textiles, waste glass. But, you know, I mean, a lot of this is stuff we use, mm. but just because it's no longer wearable, no longer functional, doesn't mean it is actually a waste. Mm -hmm. So if you can start to imagine that in the future, we'll be able to take all of these resources and raw materials, because what's already been made is the most sustainable. Yeah. You don't have to go back and make new materials, because you've got materials that have already been made. So imagine when we talk about all these products that are now being made in a way that future of manufacturing and production is done in a decentralized way. We're talking about value mm -hmm. and not necessarily always thinking about volumes. Yep. And I think to me that value proposition is important because when you make products that are fit for purpose, that do the job, you've actually achieved goals of our communities, of our industries, and most importantly, of course, when we talk about all of this, 
What we are really saying is, in all of this underpinning this is a purpose. If the fundamental element here is purpose, you can start to talk about economies of purpose. Mm -hmm. And part of this is understanding what people need. If you think about so many regional communities in Australia and in so many parts of the world, you know, people are crying out loud to say, well, we don't want all of this waste. Yep, absolutely, we would all agree with that. But imagine the transformation journey of converting this into high-quality products that go into creating homes, for instance. So those products that you need for sustainable housing projects could be coming from our waste, where products are literally made in this particular instance with our micro factories mm. in Nara. But actually, this was born out of the basement at UNSW. I mean, yeah. This is where the research started. So I know what people sort of talk about, you know, what do you do at UNSW? Well, you know, we kind of don't make music in our basement, <laughs> but we do make micro factories and products. And I guess part of that motivation for me is also as we talk about STEM and the purpose and the change for good, which is really what we're here to talk about. Mm. How do we actually inspire each other to yeah. want to be part of this ecosystem that actually wants to make a contribution and the example of our industry partner who set this up was somebody who was not even a manufacturer. I mean, this guy was simply going, I've got all of this waste fabric. Um, what do I do with it? I want to do something better than just collecting. Mm. Because once you've collected it, you've then got to ask, well, what do you, what do, you do with it? What are you doing with so it? the whole science that underpins all of this is science of micro-recycling. Mm -hmm. And that then has taken us to deploying these micro factories. But the goal certainly is to, you know, make sure that we take Australian science, what we're pioneering right here in Australia, to take it out to the world. Yep, they are micro factories, but they are big impact when it comes mm. to changing the way we start to think about how we shape the future. Absolutely. And, I mean, I just thought these were beautiful terrazzo tiles, <laughs> but they're made from all sorts of things. So <laughs> it's fantastic, and they've got such an interesting use. You can really apply to so many different areas and fields. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. I mean, we've been able to show that, you know, performance and quality is absolutely key mm. so that you can indeed start to put them into various applications. So whether you were talking about making hard green ceramic tiles for floors, because you can impart that strength quality in it, right? Because I think when we think about the fact that it's a waste material, you think it's low quality, it's not going to do anything uh, reasonably powerful. But in this case, when you actually start to challenge the science and go, no, wait a minute, these are fundamentally right down at the molecular level, at the elemental level. These are all materials. Mm. Whether we're talking about metals, you know, we're doing work on e-waste at the moment. All that complexity that goes into making metals mm. that are needed for future electrification. In all of these cases, materials have to do an important job. Mm. Whether they are, you know, looking at creating these kinds of ceramics or indeed... Imagine the future where all of our metals can be produced in a way that we're bringing all this electronics back into remanufacture. Yeah, definitely. No, that's just fascinating. <laughs> I, I could talk to you all day, Vina. I feel like your work's amazing. Um, Rachel, I'd love to move on and talk about Fire Sticks because yes. it's such an incredible organisation. Thank you. Thank um, you. I want to hear... Well, I think it'd be great for the audience to hear what, what you do, but also, I suppose, touching on innovation and technology as traditional practices. So, you know, thinking of technology not just as microchips or, you know, data and, and that kind of technology, but actually taking First Nations knowledge and history and bringing that into the way that we manage our lands. Can you kind of talk us through what Fire6 does and, and what you guys are doing? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to thank you for having me today. Um, look, at Fire Sticks, what we do is we support community uh, initiatives and programs around land management and particularly around cultural burning and fire, you know, and um, that's quite daunting for some people when we talk about fire because they think, wow, like, how dangerous, you know? Like, we look at the catastrophic bushfires and what came out of that and, you know, speaking about that, in, in, in this Indigenous non-for-profit organisation, we often find that Western science and Western technology is really uh, predominantly um, reactive to the aftermath of, of you know these these crises um, that, that that we're facing in Australia, 
and there's not a lot of um, technology that actually supports indig indigenous innovation and supporting Aboriginal people on, on country doing the hands-on practical work around around being on country and looking after our country, you know? And, and I'm not saying technology is a bad thing, because it's not, we all need technology, but we need to create technology that assists Aboriginal people to, to produce data on our lands and you know, on our waterways and, and get these two worlds colliding together so we can work together around this, yeah. Mm, absolutely. And what is the sort of, I suppose, for someone who would have no idea of what, what it is exactly that, that mm. takes a, I suppose, what does the land management look like? Are you going out there? Are you doing what we would call, you know, backburning? Like, is that, is that it? Is, what is it that you're actually yeah, doing? Yeah, there's a lot of aspects to land management, you know, and at Fire Six, what we do is we, we burn country in a cool and calm way. You know, we talk to country, we walk with country. Country has grown us up, you know. I'm an Indigenous woman from far north Queensland and I've been walking country for years with my father and my two grandfathers, you know. And um, I just want to take you back to a time before Fire 6 was established. I was there when my father introduced a video camera to my grandfathers and said, look here, this is what we're going to do. We're going to record you talking into this camera and we're going to preserve knowledge and we're going to give this knowledge to future generations to be able to learn what we do. And it's vital that we acknowledge that Indigenous people have a spot at the round table when we talk about this on a national scale because, I mean, a little bit of a no-brainer. We've been doing this for 60,000 years and we've, we've come out with great outcomes for our country and for our land, you know? Yeah, mm. definitely. You're pretty good at it, so we should yeah. listen. <laughs> Um, Vanessa, I mean, also talking about the physical environment here, your work with preserving animal biodiversity and really maintaining conservation. Also, you have to tell everyone about the x-rays in the bags oh, yes, and the AI, because yes. um, that's really cool. So I just want to know sort of what, what is it about wildlife conservation that, that matters? Why should we care? Well, we, we should all care because we have a national and an international obligation as Australians to look after our backyard. And I'm not just talking about the animals, we love animals, but I'm talking about the flora, the flora as well. So plants, our ecosystem, all of these things play important roles to each and every one of us. The breakfast you ate this morning wouldn't have been possible without maybe a cow eating grass or the bees that pollinated that food. There is all these interconnections. Also, the clothing that we are all wearing right now I'm proud to be wearing Australian made right here, but <laughs> many of the goods, the phones that you're holding in your hands right now have traveled to you via the sea. Now, to get to you coming to via the sea, there's movement in the marine world. And that movement, the facilitation of goods that we all enjoy is what I'm trying to do as a scientist, trying to preserve those animals that exist in that environment mm. that interact with us. So it's very important to answer your question that we do as much as we can as thinking outside of the box. So much of my PhD research is obviously on whales and dolphins, but one of the very, very amazing papers that we've written was looking at taking the knowledge from what we have on land, looking at roadkill and working with road ecologists. I mean, I'm a marine scientist. We don't usually hang out with the land people, right? <laughs> And we were Wait, able. Road ecologists, the job. A, well, <laughs> road ecologists look at the impacts on the marine, on the environment, animals, flora and fauna, and how that road can have impacts on the environment around yeah. and then beyond that. And then I was thinking, well, ships. The impact of a ship at the source is right there, but in the acoustic environment, sound travels distances, kilometres. Oh, wait, surely next door would be able to hear me. But if we create too much noise, then it reduces the availability of space, for example, for whales to communicate. Whales use sound to talk to each other. They go, and they make funny sounds, right? But if we are too noisy because we're delivering goods to us for it, so we can enjoy fashion, maybe then it's a little bit tricky for them to talk. So this collaboration, thinking outside of the box, merging different fields, and no doubt, I'm working with the local Gamay Rangers, which are Indigenous locals here, and we're merging science and technology to look at the marine life in our backyard as part of wild Sydney Harbour. I'm sure you all know of the first seal at the Opera House. There's more than one. <laughs> and so together we're, we're joining forces to, to learn about these things. And so my work, not only preserve, preserving the marine world, but 
on land, this is where I talk about in response to your first part of the question, mm. is one of the other problems we face is that people like to transport wildlife illegally. So, you know, you see uh, Britney Spears with her lovely, that snake many years ago, the albino boa constrictor. It'd be the equivalent of someone transporting one of those into Australia illegally. And animals that are coming into Australia can be invasive to our environment, which is not good. And then people overseas really like the shingleback lizard as a pet. This is a lizard where its head looks like its bum. We have them, they're so cool. <laughs> and people overseas love them and want them as a pet. I mean, how cool is that? And there's a defensive mechanism, so if you go for its head, but it's actually its bum, it can come around and get you. And so uh, people want to smuggle these animals overseas. And so what we're doing together with Rappi Scan Systems, Taronga Zoo, and very proudly the Australian Federal Government is I'm a chief scientist on a program where we're teaching computers using AI to look for smuggled wildlife. So essentially, when you go into an airport and you scan your bag, we will scan dead animals. That's basically part of my other job, but in different ways so that we can teach computers to go, oh my gosh, in your Dior bag, you have a lizard. <laughs> human, look at that. And then in addition to the human, sniff a dog. Can you sniff that out as well? So it's complementary methods for protecting our backyard, which if we go back to it, the breakfast that we all ate this morning, the devices that we all have, we are all part of this. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, when you put it like that, I can't argue. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I think you may have already answered this question, Vanessa. So, Vina, I'd love to ask you, do you think that these emerging technologies are being harnessed and embraced, especially by big businesses? Like, are we, are we where we need to be? I'm guessing probably not, but how do we get there? <laughs> oh, look, I mean, you know, it's interesting when we sort of look, look at Australia's role in a global context, because, I mean, all the kinds of technologies and solutions that we are developing in Australia, Australia, I think what we can do is we can actually inspire the world to take on some of these more sustainable practices. I mean, whether it is about making different kinds of materials for our building or electronic devices, I think for Australian businesses um, and the ones who are actually collaborating and working on these um, ideas with us um, at the Smart Centre at UNSW. I think one thing I've, I've got to say and, and recognise the fact that there are so many Australian businesses, um, you know, their presence globally is recognised because the more they talk about some of these important discoveries that we're making in Australia and through collaboration, because we mm. can't do it alone. This is about collaboration and partnership. So that means that research, its translation, and, and ultimately the impact on the world is something that, you know, we may be a small country with a small population, but I think the impact that we have is big. I mean, our technologies, we've, we've now commercialised green steel mm. in Australia. The fact that that brings in waste tires as a feedstock in making of steel. That's something that was not only from a scientific perspective done here, but again to talk about the fact that Australian businesses who have championed and taken it on and now wanting to take that out to the rest of the world, I think to me is an important sort of recognition that we have to give to those businesses who are, you know, not only looking at that research happening in Australia, but also that rapid translation into practical outcomes. Mm. And the fact that we can now showcase, you know, I mean, an example with this one, with our micro factories, I mean, what we've been blown away is in such a short time that, you know, since we first deployed this in Australia, that there are enough businesses in Australia, those early adopters, who are saying, you know what, every time there's an opportunity to do a fit out or to be able to install products, we would much rather have Australian-made products made in regional communities from waste resources. So that whole kind of broader picture that we're talking about, how do we actually do the right thing when it comes to the implications for our environment? But the other side of it is implications for people. Mm. You know, you talk about a regional microfactory in Nowra, um, we've created 10 jobs on that one micro factory, where otherwise a lot of these materials would have, of course, ended up in landfills. So part of that collaboration that we talk about, you know, with these businesses, from SMEs to larger corporations, is that there are businesses in Australia who want to not only show 
that we can have this big impact here in Australia, but also hopefully inspire, yeah. you know, others across the world. Well, globally, I mean, mm. Professor Vina went and talked to Prada in Milan mm -hmm. about this, so it's it's happening all over the world, really. Yeah, it's yeah, fantastic. That, um, um, and Rachel, I'd love to ask you, because we're running out of time, I feel like we've got so many questions still, and I want to make sure we're getting audience questions. Um, but Rachel, how can kind of us, you know, non-Indigenous Australians also work with you and work with your communities to make sure that we're maintaining the, these traditional methods of land preservation? Yeah, I think the most important part, first and foremost, is we need to allow Indigenous people to have space to revive and regrow their knowledge. You know, we need to be able to listen and vocal, like, uh, sorry, amplify their voices. Um, an important one is education. We need to restructure our education system. You know, we need to target our younger generation because I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we're all not going to be around for the outcomes we're fighting for. So we need to support our children and give them the tools they need. Um, and that's not just, you know, my children. That's black or white. They're, we all have a massive job to play here. So, you know, we need to work together to, to make that happen. Mm, absolutely. I'm going to just go to our audience questions now. There's one for you, Vina. Um, someone would like to know, what message or advice would you like to share with the next generation of innovators aiming to create a better tomorrow? Mm. Actually, I mean, I feel like you could all answer this. <laughs> oh, that's such an important question, isn't it? Because I think, you know, we all have brilliant ideas and we all, you know, when we kind of immerse ourselves into the work we do, no matter where we work, um, and, and I think we bring our heads and our hearts, mm. you know, yeah. to, to the work we do. That is so important. Your, your head might be saying, you know, you've got all the right ideas, you've mapped out, you've created a plan. Uh, but I think it is so important that as an innovator, as somebody who might be looking to convert that into a business opportunity, is to be able to also take your whole self, you know, with you, why you're doing what you're doing. That personal passion is mm. important. Um, but I think equally important, if you want to show leadership through your ideas, it's also about inspiring your communities, inspiring your peers, mm. and, and inspiring those businesses who might have never thought about, you know, working in the space. I mean, for us, this example of our micro factory, our industry partner, Andrew, who's, who's now set up and operates this micro factory in Nara, I mean, this was a guy who was working with us for many years and who just basically said, look, pile of mattresses, pile of tires please help me, mm, right? Yeah. And so went from sort of, here's, here's what I have, and that was, that was the first sort of uh, micro factory we set up in Kudamandra, um, you know, a couple of years ago. That meant that for someone like Andrew, it was not just about saying, well, here's great innovation, great ideas coming out of the labs, but it was that collaborative partnership. So again, it's important as an innovator and as somebody who wants to make a difference and you want to be able to make that, you know, impact on the planet and people. Yeah. You have yeah. to actually have a journey and that journey of innovation never really stops. It continuously evolves and grows. And as more people kind of really latch on to what you're saying, because people will sense your, your passion and your excitement. Mm. I think whatever those ideas are, it is important that you do bring your head and your heart to yeah. that conversation. Absolutely. We have one from Abby, which I, I like, and I want to kind of, you know, maybe finish off with this from each of you. And Rachel, I want to start with you. She said, quick fire in capitals. So quick fire. <laughs> um, we would like two audience, two things that we can start doing today to help. So maybe Rachel, we'll start with you. Yeah, look, I would start by um, backing and researching your grassroots uh, organisations, you know, your black-led non-for-profit organisations as well in that space, um, and amplifying the voices you have around you. You know, there's a ton of knowledge sitting around in this room here. You know, reach out and, and engage with those spaces. Um, and also, also, like, just starting off small, you know, in your regions, reaching out to First Nations people and the issues that they're facing, it might feel insignificant what you're doing, but starting off small like that will actually give you time to appreciate the culture that we have, you know, and that's important too because it's your culture too, you know. This is our land, this is our country. So, yeah, starting small like that, I think, is a great thing to do. Mm. Yeah, wonderful mm. advice. And Vina? Yeah, uh, look, I would probably say, you know, start at that local level where you're really asking questions around, you know, if you're going to be making choices in life, 
which we all have to do from simple things or what we might purchase, mm. um, asking that question around, you know, what were some of the practices? You know, what kind of practices were used in, you know, not only the materials that went into that product, how was that product made? I mean, it is important that we ask those ask questions. Those questions yeah. Ask those questions. And if you're not satisfied with the answer, you know, yeah, get really annoying to people, yeah. you know? yeah. Yes, <laughs> yeah, become definitely. annoying. Definitely. And, and Vanessa? Well, two things. One that we can all do right now is don't release balloons into the air. <laughs> you, might, you might think I'm absolutely crazy, but honestly, what goes up has come down and the amount of times I'm doing whale research off Sydney and I see balloons, it's very disruptive. So please, so that's one simple action. The other thing is we need to think about our next generation. I can, there are a few children in this room, so I say well done to the mums because I've left my seven-month-old and my two-and-a-half-year-old at home. Hope they're okay. But honestly, now as a scientist, now having children... I hope children, there's someone with them, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Very capable. But now as a scientist, as an early career researcher, being on a stage with these wonderful women, collaborating, networking, and looking to the next step is really important. And our role as doing what we do by being passionate, no doubt, I think you worked out we're quite passionate about what we do, if we can use our role in society to inspire the next generation, this is something you can all do by having a chat, whether it be to your children, your niece or your nephew. This is the kind of thing we all need to be talking about, especially if we're talking about change for good. STEM, science, technology, engineering and math, with art in its STEAM, is part of the everyday. The jobs of the tomorrow don't even exist yet. This is an opportunity for everyone to collaborate, think across fields and just say yes and, and be inspired. So that's my last words. No, wonderful last words. Thank you so much. Thank you.